sì, ma è impressionante la, la, la quantità di, di sogni, di visioni, di, di capacità di immaginazione, di creatività e poi di concretezza che sia Ray che Takaki ci hanno dimostrato stasera. È davvero un, un grande regalo averli qui oggi perché ci mostrano che, che è possibile, ok? Qualsiasi sogno è possibile, a patto di, di, di la lavorare, riuscire a, a mettere insieme dei, dei gruppi di, di, di ricerca di alto livello, di, di cooperare, eh, è straordinario, per me è veramente straordinario. Io devo dire, l'ultimo ospite è Werner Hoffman, Werner Hoffman è direttore del Max Planck Institute di Heidelberg ed è portavoce di CTA, Cerenkov Telescope Array, che ha organizzato questo simposio e ha avuto anche questa splendida idea di eh, un incontro con, con, tutti voi, con tutti voi questa sera. Noi tutti siamo abituati a pensare alla velocità della luce nel vuoto come un limite che non si può superare. E questo è certamente vero se appunto si considera la, la velocità della luce nel vuoto. Però quando la luce si muove attraverso un mezzo, tipo l'acqua oppure l'aria, l'atmosfera, può capitare che in certe circostanze alcune particelle la superino, la superino in velocità. Quando questo accade, queste particelle emettono una luce. Bene, è proprio da questa idea che si è partiti per pensare al Cherenkov Telescope Array. Questa luce emessa da particelle che si muovono a velocità superiori della luce si chiama appunto luce effetto Cherenkov, emessa per effetto Cherenkov. Ve ne parlerà appunto Werner Hoffman. You can use this one yep. or this one, wow, nice. the one you prefer. Yeah. Well, uh, the reason we are all here is because of the CTA symposium, and so maybe it's not a bad idea to tell you what the Cherenkov Telescope Array is. Now, what we've heard so far, we've heard about cosmic messengers, neutrinos, we've heard about gravitational waves, which send ripples through space and time. But still, most of what we know from the universe, we know through electromagnetic waves, through light. All the wonderful pictures which modern telescopes, like the Hubble telescope, give us, pictures of distant galaxies amazingly resolved. Uh, also pictures of nebula in our own galaxy, of star-forming regions. All these wonderful pictures you probably have seen somewhere Uh, in, in journals or, or in, in talks. And there's, for example, this sparkling cloud of stars towards the galactic center. However, you're probably aware that these pictures of this sky, which you see with your eyes in the visible light, this light encompasses a certain range of wavelengths of frequency It goes from red on one end to blue on the other end of the spectrum. The red end has the light with the long wavelengths, the low frequency, the low energy per quantum of light. The blue end has the short wavelengths, the high frequency, the high energy. However, this range in wavelengths is just a factor of two. So it covers, it can be compared to one octave on a piano. The light or the electromagnetic radiation we, we, we receive from space, however, is much more. Radiation from space encompasses about 70 octaves. And 70 octaves, that corresponds to the sounds of a 15 meter long piano. So on this 15 meter long cosmic piano, you have on the, on the low pitch side, the radio waves, then comes the infrared, the visible light, the ultraviolet, the x-rays, and the very high-pitched sounds on the right end of this cosmic piano are the gamma rays. And much of modern astrophysics has been exploring the other 69 octaves of the spectrum outside the visible and making this accessible to observation. And to illustrate to you why it's so important to be able to listen to this whole spectrum of cosmic sounds, uh, what I've taken is I've taken a familiar piece of music and I've cut out one octave of the spectrum, 
Yeah? One octave corresponds to the visible light which we see with our eyes. Now listen to this familiar piece of music uh, in one octave of the spectrum. Let's hope this works. Very strange. You probably don't figure out what it is. You certainly don't enjoy it. So that's the problem because you're listening in just one octave. Now let's try to take the pin piece of music and listen to it on the only 10 octaves of the acoustic spectrum, not to mention the 70 octaves of the cosmic spectrum. And if I play you the music with the whole spectrum, uh, you will certainly recognize what it is. And you certainly enjoy it much more, much more. So this just serves to illustrate how important it is to listen to the whole spectrum of cosmic sounds from the very low pitched radio waves to the very high pitched gamma rays. And gamma rays is what CTA is about and what we'll be talking about for the rest of the day. Gamma rays are the most extreme radiation. They have a wavelength, which is a small fraction of the size of an atomic nucleus. They have energies per light quantum, which is a million, million times higher than that of visible light. They're incredibly energetic radiation. Uh, but gamma rays in the end, they are a form of light. They're electromagnetic radiation. But it turns out they're somewhat different. And if you wish, uh, the reason they are different is basically all Einstein's fault. Now let me explain uh, what I mean by this. Uh, let's take an atom, which is sort of the elementary nucleus of matter, the elementary building block of matter. It's made of an electron which circles around the nucleus. And the energy with which this system, this electron, is bound, well, you take Einstein, energy is mc squared, mass times square of velocity of light. So the energy at which the system is bound is something like uh, the mass of the electron times the velocity of light squared times some numerical factor, which I don't care about right now. But that's the relevant scale, and it's just Einstein E equals mc squared. Now, the important difference now comes because for all the left-hand side of the spectrum, the energy of the quanta is much smaller than mc squared, the binding energy of an atom. On the right side for the gamma rays, the energy of the quantum is much, much larger typically than the binding energy of an atom. That has very important consequences. On the left-hand side, over most of the spectrum, radiation is emitted by hot bodies. It's like iron glowing red at 800 degrees and yellow at 1200 degrees. It's thermal radiation. It's just hot stuff producing the light that we see. That works well except for gamma rays. Why? Well, a gamma ray has an energy which is much larger compared to the binding energy of, a molecule, of an atom. How can an atom emit something which is much larger than its own binding energy? It would immediately blow up. So you cannot make gamma rays by thermal radiation. And the only way people have come up to make gamma rays of these energies is by cosmic particle accelerators. Imagine things like our earthly particle accelerator somewhere in space. Of course, they will look different. They accelerate nuclei to enormous energies. This nuclei bump into something, interstellar gas. Uh, they form secondary particles, and among these are these high-energy gamma rays. So these are particle reactions like the one which we see in our colliders here in the bubble chamber. And some of these things coming out are gamma rays. So that's sort of the idea. Gamma rays show you a different universe. They don't show you the thermal universe of hot bodies. They show you a universe of odd things like cosmic particle accelerators. Now, this boundary, this gap, has another important consequence. And the consequence is that it's hard to detect gamma rays, in a sense. Why? Well. In all this range, you can build lenses and mirrors that focus light. Of course, Galileo's first telescope with a few lenses imaging light, radio telescope, which focuses radio waves on a receiver here. Even for X-rays, 
you can build lenses. They look a bit odd, in fact, in Italian company is one of the pioneers of these techniques. But just believe me, this thing focuses x-rays and makes an image. Now, gamma rays, the energy of a quantum is much larger than any energy in matter. So if that hits matter, it just blows up the matter. There's no way to build a mirror or a lens for gamma rays. The only thing you can do is you put a block of, block of matter into the path of the gamma ray, and having energy which is much larger than mc squared, it will just make new particles. It generates a cascade of secondary particles running over typically sort of a meter of, of uh, say, a concrete block until all the energy is used up in secondary particles and the thing is slowly stopped. So the only way to detect gamma rays, you put something in its way, it makes this cascade and you somehow try to detect the cascade. Okay, now these are some of the instruments, some of the telescopes, which, which we currently de detect gamma rays. You see here the band of the Milky Way. This is a time-lapse movie. Of course, things move much faster than they do in reality. Uh, but now you should ask yourself, what, what is this guy telling us? First, I tell you he cannot build telescopes for gamma rays. And then I show you instruments which detect gamma rays. What's happening there? Well, these things work a bit differently, and let me tell you how they work. They're so-called Cherenkov telescopes, and what we do is we simply use the Earth's atmosphere as a block of matter. A gamma ray comes in, it generates a cascade of secondary particles, and now we somehow need to detect this gamma ray track, this cascade of particles, Unfortunately, when particles rush through the air at the speed of light, they emit something called Cherenkov light. It's a blue light and it's beamed forward like the headlights of a car. So you get this beam of blue light, which on the Earth illuminates a circle of maybe two, three hundred meter diameter. And if you place a telescope in this, or if a telescope happens to sit in this light pool, as we call it, you can take a picture of this particle cascade. This picture may look like this. And then you track this cascade back to the sky where the gamma ray came from. So you can think about it, it's like a meteor track. A gamma ray makes in the atmosphere what's a meteor track, and you take a picture of that meteor track, except it's very faint, you can't see it with your eyes, and it's very short-lived, a few billions of a second. And what one typically does, since one is looking at track in the atmosphere, one wants to take point it back in space, one needs not just one view, but multiple telescopes looking at this track from different sides, so that like with the human stereoscopic viewing, you can reconstruct it in space. Uh, there are a number of such instruments which do that. So these are big telescopes collecting the faint chunk of light. Uh, this is a, our HES system in Namibia, the MAGIC system on the Canary Islands, and the VERITAS system in the United States. Let me just highlight the MAGIC system here a little bit, uh, because that has a very strong participation by Italian scientists and has some, had some, some very spectacular results recently. Now, there's one important thing you need to understand about this technique. These telescopes don't take pictures of the sky. They take pictures of tracks in the atmosphere which point back to the sky. So one of these pictures of a particle cascade in the atmosphere gives us one point in the sky where this gamma ray came from. It's not yet a sky image in gamma rays. To get a sky image, we need to collect many of such pictures and superimpose and slowly some structure in the sky will emerge. And that can actually take days or even weeks of exposure until slowly a picture of the gamma ray sky builds up. Now, this picture which you see building up is of course nothing in the real sky. This is CTA written into the sky as the future of gamma ray astronomy. But that's sort of how CTA, if it were a gamma ray source, would look in the sky. Now, how does the real sky look like? Well, it took over a decade of observations of the Milky Way to see how the Milky Way looks in gamma rays. And this is, of course, now an extreme time lapse. And you see that the entire Milky Way is lined with sources of gamma rays, meaning all these are cosmic particle accelerators in our Milky Way. It's not a rare phenomenon. 
it seems to happen everywhere, the strange non-thermal universe. Now, what are these things? I can't tell you all the details, but one type is something which you already heard of, which is a supernova explosion. A supernova, an exploding star, sends a shockwave into space at speeds of many thousands of kilometers per second, and this shockwave can accelerate particles. And one way of imagining how it does that is it's a little bit like an atomic nucleus being caught in this blast wave, and like a surfer riding on a wave, this atomic nucleus is riding the blast wave and it's gaining energy. Uh, and what we see in the end, of course, is not the accelerated particle, but the gamma ray, which is made of this accelerated particle, bumps into something. So we don't see the surfer, we see the cry, the surfer lets go when he hits a log or something. So that's, uh, now you can ask, well, if cosmic explosion make gamma rays, all of you, of course, have heard about the, the, the giant black hole discovered in ABD, M87. A black hole is a very violent cosmic event. Shouldn't that make gamma rays? Of course it does. Uh, it's in fact a, a joint measurement of all these three instruments. And what's remarkable is that the flux of gamma rays in this event goes up and down on a scale of days, which is surprising since this, this, this black hole has a, a scale of a light day. So how this thing can turn on and off and make gamma rays within a day is one of the big mysteries. Okay, so one of my astrophysics colleagues said, well, comparing this low energy sky or this not thermal universe to the gamma ray universe is like comparing a picture with nice twinkling stars, that's sort of our thermal universe, to a picture of the sky of Vincent van Gogh, which is shown here. It's a turbulent, it's a dynamic sky. You see the light coming from places where there are large matter flows, where there are large energy concentration. And my colleague called this, gamma rays show you the energy skeleton of the universe. Now there is a little problem, which is that our current instruments are not quite sensitive enough to reveal this whole Van Gogh dynamic sky. We sort of see fascinating glimpses on it, but we don't see the full sky. So that's why a team of scientists, of which you see here only a small fraction, got together to build a next generation instrument which gives us a full picture of this dynamic sky. Uh, and this picture will be done by CTA the Cherenkov Telescope Array. Now, this group of scientists encompasses more than 1,400 scientists and engineers from 200 institutes in 31 countries. Now, the question is, how do you build such a 10 times more powerful instrument to detect gamma rays and watch the extreme universe? Well, let's have a look. This is one of our current instruments. There are four telescopes symbolized by these circles. And now what happens is a gamma ray comes in, it makes a cascade in the atmosphere, illuminates a circle of about 200 meters on the ground. These four telescopes take images of this gamma ray. We can reconstruct the track in space. Everything's fine. Now comes the next gamma ray, and of course it comes in some place. So let's see. This is the next one, damned miss it. Yeah, no, not a single picture. This one, gone. This one, a single telescope. You need two eyes to reconstruct a track in space, useless. Ah, that's a nice one. This one, two telescopes, not perfect, but halfway useful. This one, again, missed it. So from now, the answer should be obvious. How do you build a better, a better telescope, uh, a better instrument? You simply put on a lot more telescopes. Yeah, now you take the same gamma rays, a light flash here, perfect. A light flash here, perfect. A light flash here, we saw it. A light flash there, fine. Final one here, everything's perfect. Now there's a little problem, of course, which is the telescopes cost money and many telescopes cost a lot of money. So you need to economize a little bit. And the way we economize is by not building one type of telescopes, but building different types of telescopes, building a few large telescopes which cover 
the very low energy, dim gamma rays, and building many small, rather cheap telescopes to cover the large area and cover the high energies where gamma rays are rare and where I need to detect them over a large area. So this is sort of a, uh, an artist's view of the Cherokov telescope array. And let me just get this movie going. You see it is, in this case, 100 telescopes, close to 100 telescopes, spread over the side. You see the different telescope types with different mirror areas. And you'll just in a second see an aerial view uh, of this system showing at the core, the low energy part, then medium sized telescopes and very small telescopes at the outer edge covering a large area. So thereby economizing the construction costs and still covering the full spectrum of gamma rays with a required sensitivity. So, and then these telescopes observe the light flashes uh, from space as symbolized here uh, in this, in this uh, animation. So we already have, we, we, we are at the, at the verge of starting the construction of CTA. There are prototypes of all these telescopes. This is a prototype of a small size telescope uh, inaugurated on Sicily. And you notice know small is relative. This is a fairly sizable telescope. I should mention it there, there are three different designs of the prototypes are under test in France and in Poland. So we'll build 70 of these. Then this is a medium-sized telescope. We'll build 40, or we plan to build 40 of these. And you see this is a quite sizable instrument. And the large telescope, which has a 23-meter mirror diameter, of which there will be four on each of the sides. Uh, that one was inaugurated on La Palma uh, and uh, Takaki Kajita was, was participating in this event. Uh, this is the first actual CTA telescope on the northern side. Now, what do you mean by northern side? Well, one essential feature of CTA is we want to see the full sky. Uh, because there are many phenomena which are in the south or in the north. To be really sensitive, you want to cover the full sky. So there will be two sides uh, of telescope arrays one on the Canary Island of La Palma in Spain, one in Chile on the ESO lands uh, in the southern hemisphere. And here you see uh, artists' views uh, of these two arrays. On the north, construction has started with the first telescope. In the south right now, there's just an empty desert. And it, for, it really calls for being filled with telescopes. And we'll do that uh, over the next years. So, you've already heard the CTA headquarters from which the whole project is steered are here in Bologna. That's why we're having this symposium. Uh, Federico Ferrini is the director of the observatory of the company which will build the observatory. And so we're really looking very much forward to in about five years or so, so having CTA operational and then together with neutrino observatories, together with gravitational wave observatories, together with new radio observatories, give us new visions of the sky, allowing us to look beyond borders, uh, to explore the unknown universe. And I must say, I'm, I'm, I'm very curious and very much looking forward to all the surprises and to all the great discoveries and to the news about the universe in which we live. Uh, which these instruments jointly will bring us. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Werner. Thanks a lot again.